The Dalai Lama once said that today, more than ever before, life must be characterized by a sense of universal responsibility, not only nation to nation and human to human, but also human to other forms of life. Join me in conversation with some of the world's most creative thinkers to explore the importance of ethics to this responsible decision-making in today's technologically infused world. Artists, entrepreneurs, scientists, journalists, academics, and beyond navigate the gray, the blend of right and wrong, of opportunities and risks on all sides of our most important challenges, whether gene editing, civilian space travel, or artificial intelligence. They also probe the age-old and more ethically black and white behaviors, such as sexual misconduct, human trafficking, and life-threatening inequality. Our guests endeavor to transcend religious, political, national, and ethnic perspectives, but recognize the inevitable biases we all bring. The term ethics can make us uncomfortable. At the Ethics Incubator, we confront the E-word head-on. It may be inconvenient or even unclear, but ethical conundrums underpin almost every headline and affect almost every human choice. With truth under threat and the boundaries of humanity blurring, I believe that ethical decision-making tethers us to our humanity. As always, we welcome your thoughts. So Shannon, a very warm welcome to the Ethics Incubator. Shannon is an American actress and martial artist and businesswoman and the president of the Bruce Lee Foundation, and also the author of a wonderful book that we're going to be discussing called Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee. And Shannon is Bruce Lee's daughter. Shannon, let's start talking about you to anchor the conversation a little bit. I know everybody asks you about, you know, your memories of your father when you were a very young child, but where were you born and how you got to writing this wonderful book? So I was born in Santa Monica, California. This was during a period of my family's life and my father's life when we were living in Los Angeles. He was trying to make it in Hollywood. The the Green Hornet TV series had been canceled already for a couple years. And um, I would say it was a, a time of struggle somewhat in my family's life. And of course, as we know, my father, you know, shortly after I was born, actually, he injured his back quite seriously and um, had to take a break from teaching, from training and from pursuing his career careers and really go inward and I have a lot of introspection. And in fact, a lot of the writings that we have from my father are from that time in his life because he was immobile, <laughs> which for him was uh, a very much a challenge. And so the interesting thing about it is, is that then later on, going through the rest of our lives, we moved to Hong Kong, he made the movies, he passed away very prematurely and suddenly. And you were um, a very young child. I was four years old when he passed away. Yes. And my, you know, my memories of him are very, are very spare in terms of the long form visual type of memory, but my memory, my sense memory of him is in fact very strong. It, it's funny, you know, I guess I'm here to attest to how people always say, oh, those first four years or five years of a child's life or those formative years are so important. They're so important. And I'm here to attest that they are because I used to think all throughout my life as I was growing up, like that maybe I was a little bit crazy because I felt like I knew my father so well. And it came, I came to realize that that is my memory of him is that the feeling of him, his energy, how I experienced him through my senses, because that's how young children take in the world. And that feeling that he imparted to me of love and of safety has carried me through my entire life. So fast forward yeah. and you're writing this wonderful book. And yeah. for anybody who thinks it's just for martial artists, it's quite the opposite. It's really the lessons from his life, from his struggles, from his successes, and from, as you say, his philosophy 
some of which um, was really developed and written down during that time when he was immobile. All of it is applicable, everybody else's life and life struggles. And I think it's fantastic that you're protecting his legend, um, but also that the book gives all of us a window into how we can take a little bit of it into our own lives. And indeed, there's a real ethics underpinning to a lot of it. But if I can jump right in, the title, Be Water, My Friend, what yeah. does that mean to you? And what did that mean to Bruce Lee? I would say sort of in an overarching way, the idea of being like water, which is something my father talked about often, is really a lesson in formlessness. And what that means is, you know, certainly fluidity, flexibility, adaptability. It's also about being one's natural self, being in harmony with one's surroundings with one's relationships and being vibrantly alive and engaged and present. So, you know, my father had a maxim that he used to represent his life and his martial arts, which was using no way as way, having no limitation as limitation. And really that is a description of what it is to be like water, that you can that water always finds a way. It's, it, it will seep through any crack. It will go against any rock. It will find its way around any obstacle. And um, it's unlimited. It will, if allowed, it will always flow. So I was struck by a couple of the images in the book. One is that water will fill an object like an empty cup to yes. become the form of that object. But also, yes. as you say, it is persistent. It will find its way through cracks through softness through it will wind up if it's not a direct route it will find another route and i found that fascinating but there's another image also about a cup in the book that i wonder if you can comment on which i think is critically important also to ethics and for lessons for all of us which is that if your cup is full you can't take the tea that somebody might be offering you so yeah. you sort of need to, need to empty your cup and if i'm understanding this image properly it's that we need to stop thinking we know everything and be open to having our cup filled with others' wisdom, with others' knowledge. The famous quote by my father, the very first sentence of that quote about being like water is, empty your mind. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. And that's what I mean by formlessness. And in order to do that, you need to get out of your own way. Like as a society, we're very caught up in our own thinking, our own storytelling about life. And we have a lot of judgments. We have a lot of belief systems. We have a lot of preconceived ideas. Uh, we come in with a lot of experiences that we've had, both positive and negative, and they inform our thinking and they inform our interactions. Um, so much so that oftentimes we're just really listening to our own thoughts rather than experiencing what's actually happening and, you know, letting down that being very open, open-minded to be able to experience life as it's happening without judging it and storytelling about it all the time. And, you know, if you're just sitting there judging everything against your own experience, then you're not really able to take in something new, right? Or to assess a, a new experience or to even be open to that experience. I tell my students at Stanford that ethics happens in reality and yeah. you can do it theoretically. You can do it outside of reality all you want, but reality will always come back to bite. And I love the fact that there was a lot of talk about his philosophy, but his philosophy played out in the street. His philosophy played out in the movie sets. What you're saying about reality as it's actually happening instead of reality as we wish it were, reality as we expect it to be, all of these kind of preconceived ideas, or as you say, reality as we judge it, I, I found really fascinating. One of the things I say about my father is he didn't just espouse philosophy, he lived his philosophy. He put it to the test, right? And even in his martial arts, like when he would see martial arts contests of the day where people were, you know, just doing point tapping, he, he used to call that dry land swimming. Swimming, you can theorize 
and you can do like light, light touch practice of things. But until you're like really in the real life, trying to apply these things or the real combat scenario, trying to apply these things, it's all dry land swimming. Let me read you a quote from the book that I would love you to comment on if I may. You say, what if we came to understand that we have some control here and in fact, direct and recondition our minds toward new possibilities instead of remaining unconscious or ignorant of workings? What if we could work in collaboration with our minds rather than be at the mercy of our thoughts? What if negative could be converted to positive? What if fear could be transformed into enthusiasm? What if mistakes could become the pathways to our dreams? My father focused just as much on energy, just as much energy on conditioning his mind as he did on training his body. And I'm wondering if you can comment on that. There's so much. So a lot of us would like to have stronger minds. I certainly would. And one of the things that I'm seeing everywhere in society, including with my students, is a real quest for perfection, which is mm. dangerous to mental health. And in my view, neither a laudable goal nor an achievable one. And what you seem to be saying here is none of this, none of his philosophy, none of his reality is about a quest for perfection. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about conditioning the mind and what can we learn from him and from you? You know, my father trained his mind as diligently as he trained his body. And we seem to have this idea that our thoughts and our feelings run us. Um, and of course they do. They are signals that are coming in, but we are able to utilize them if we work toward that kind of presence, awareness, and mastery. And as you say, this notion of perfection, which I also talk a little bit about in the book, is very dangerous. It's not possible to be perfect. Oftentimes, we are too afraid to take a risk or a chance or try something because we want to know how it's going to turn out before we get started. And the truth of the matter is you can't know that. Life is ever-changing and Oftentimes the fear of something is much more um, damaging and paralyzing than the actual thing is. And so my father trained his mind in a number of ways. He observed his mind. He observed his emotions. And we can all do that. We oftentimes are so close to our thoughts that we're not aware that we're actually observing them. And we can observe them if you can stand back and sort of close your eyes and, and sit quietly for a moment, you can watch your mind think, right? And because you can watch your mind think, it means that there's some sort of conscious awareness that is more aligned to your true being than what's going on in here. But I think that's really important. I know my, I have an incredible karate sensei and he talks a lot about detached mind. And he yes. seems to be able to do 25 things at once and still have a detached mind. I'm nowhere close. Do you do anything as a matter of practical uh, sort of daily practice to, to train your mind? I do. I do meditation. And I also just really attempt to step back a little bit, that sort of detachment in a way. If I feel something in my body or think something you know, it takes practice. This is what I mean by train your mind. It takes practice because we're used to being carried away by our emotions and our thoughts, right? So um, it takes practice to go, ooh, wow, I, I'm really upset by that. Or, ooh, wow, I'm really, that makes me really happy. But being able to sort of like have that observation of yourself. My father said, if you want to, if you want to change your life, then you just really need to practice observing how you are in the world and then having inquiry about that. And I was going to ask you if we can switch gears for a minute. Are there things that you think the public doesn't know about your father that you wish they did that maybe you didn't put in the book? My father's philosophy has been very healing and transformational for me personally. It's why I steward his legacy. It's why I find value in that. And I think another reason I wrote the book is because I don't think people really understand the depth of philosopher that my father was. I know they know he has some cool quotes, but I don't know that they know the depth of it. I, I recently sent his book collection up to the Wing Luke Museum, 
which was over 2,800 books, many of them annotated and underlined in the margin, you know, annotated the margins and underlined. They, he liked to do what was called prescriptive reading. So anything that he had interest in that what he was curious about, that he wanted to know more about, he would find books and he would not just buy the books of the day. He would go to bookstores and try to find out of all the out of print volumes. He wanted to understand the trajectory of something and really take it in fully. And then, you know, he, I think was a master synthesizer. He was really good at boiling things down to their essential bits, right? And, and taking that in his big prescription was research your own experience, accept what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is essentially and uniquely your own. People don't understand that. The reason he can, his performances in his movies continue to thrill and continue to excite is the depth and the foundation of his personal growth practice. Do you think there would be one ethical mistake that he would say he made? That he may say that the, one of the mistakes he made was pushing too hard. He had a goal for himself. You know, one of the goals that he had was to star in a Hollywood film. He wanted to uh, show and represent in Hollywood an authentic Asian man, a portrayal of an authentic Asian man. And that was a goal and he was going to accomplish that goal. And I think he pursued it at all costs. When you look at a lot of his writings, he talks about how, you know, he's going to do all this hard work because what he really wants is to lead, lead a peaceful, harmonious life. But I think that um, sometimes the goal got ahead of the sort of end result he was looking for. And he got out of balance as we often do as human beings. I think actually it's quite helpful to see a legend, maybe if I can put it respectfully, is go too far in some ways to try to reach a goal and really see that there are consequences to that. We have to be constantly balancing how we're achieving our goals with our goals. From, from all of his philosophy, what would be the one thing that is most important for you? His real philosophy was one of self-actualization. Mm -hmm. And I think what I would say is... So much we're trying to accumulate knowledge and accumulate skill in our pursuit of greatness, perfection, excellence, whatever you want to call it, when really what we're needing to do is be more reductive. We're needing to hack away the unessentials, as my father would say, and sort of remember and work from the core of our being, the things we need to discover what the core of our being is. We need to discover what that essential self is. And then we need to operate from there. And I think that for me, it's been over time about like reducing the extraneous noise and not getting caught up in too much ego or too much fear or too much thought of like, oh, I have to make sure my reputation is a certain way. It's like, no, I just have to be myself do the work to understand what that is. And then I just have to try to reflect that out into the world and in harmony with the world and with my fellow human being. And that's the water, right? Yes. I mean, I guess the harmony with the rest of the world where the water is adapting. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah. And water is an essential component of life. Like our bodies are made up with a mass amount of water, our world is created through water. Water is a medium through which life exists, right? Without water, then life cannot flourish. And so that is, you know, water adapts and to the surroundings, but it also nourishes its surroundings. Yes, of course, there are times when there are hurricanes or tidal waves or that kind of thing, but oftentimes it's because there's a, an out of balance that's happening. I would say another really important philosophy of my father's is what he would call the art of dying, which is the art of letting go, learning how to lose rather than always only focusing on how to win. Uh, Chik Nhat Hanh, the former Buddhist monk, um, said that 
for those who learn how to suffer, you actually suffer much less. So how, do, what does that mean to you? I, I'm very familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh, but what does that mean to learn how to suffer? How do we learn how to suffer? First, we recognize that we're suffering all the time. Our thoughts, our emotions, they work on us. They cause so much suffering. There are levels of suffering. I think you hear the word suffering and you think catastrophic pain right. or you think you know trauma or tragedy, but we're suffering in just the discomfort and the um, irritation, even boredom is a form of suffering. Like, so the idea is to understand we're suffering all the time in our human. Be comfortable in discomfort. Yeah, be comfortable in discomfort. Figure out how to use discomfort to find actually the opposite of that, right? To find happiness, use the darkness to find the light. What you were saying about ego and reputation, I mean, we're caught up in a world that is so much more micro and we get more and more focused on ourselves. And that's certainly something I've seen in the younger generation is that this idea that we can each have a cell phone and we can program the world to be the way we want it to be. We can yep. listen to any music we want at any time we want and for free. And one of the things that I'm finding is that the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I wanted to ask you about a very famous quote, which is about um, somebody pointing at the moon. And the quote is, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's something along the lines of don't focus too much on the finger pointing at the moon or you're going to miss the moon. And I think we're in this, you know, as a society, but I think individually also we're at this time where we're missing the bigger picture. And yeah. so many big mistakes are being made because people are missing the bigger picture of their own lives. People are very focused on being right. And um, it's hard to have love, collaboration and co-creation if what you want to be is right. This is part of the empty your mind, you know? It's like, we're so focused on the polarities on right and wrong and good and bad. And these polarities are just the extreme ends of, of an experience, mm -hmm. of an experience of life. We're very harsh um, and rush to judgment very quickly of others. And uh, without understanding that, that we do the same thing that we see other people do all the time. When we're judging someone for something that they've done, we're being judgmental. We're trying to accumulate some sense of approval, some sense of love, really. Like really at the core, all of our worst motivations come from a desire to be okay, from a desire to be seen to be appreciated to belong to belong or to, to win the prizes i think you say in the book somewhere yeah you know to win the prize to belong to feel like you know i'm i'm winning at life i'm doing a good job and the interesting thing is that my father did not believe in competition as a martial artist you would think he would but competition pits us against one another and rather than collaboration or a coming together or co-creation. And when we are caught up in competition, we're focused on the outside rather than on the inside, mm -hmm. you know, which, so, which is why I say in the book, if competition is a useful tool for you, because it is for many people, then compete with yourself. Try to be better than you were last time, you know, rather than better than that person over there. I also find, I must say, I hear a lot about karate competitions and, and I don't compete. Uh, for one thing, I'm not good enough. And for another thing, I'm, I'm not the right age anymore. But um, I hear a lot about people saying, oh, I, you know, I won gold or I won first prize or whatever. And part of me is thinking to myself, well, I don't know who else was in the room. Like maybe somebody great was in the room, but maybe somebody very weak and you won this prize that says first prize, but it was no big deal because the person you competed against wasn't that great. So mm -hmm. I think you're, I think you're right. This very, this excessive focus on, on the outside. Do you have yourself outside of your father's teaching um, any sort of core ethical principles or a sense of your own true North, or is it very much based on your father's teaching, which, which is so capacious as it is. One of the things about my father's teachings is that they're based on very long held sacred principles in a lot of ways. And so Taoism, right? Like 
<laughs> That's been around for centuries. Um, it's part of his belief system. But I wouldn't say, so I guess what I would say is within his writings, there is a lot there to work with. But I wouldn't say I am my father. In fact, you know, as as we say, you know, um, he could be out of balance, just like I, I can be out of balance. We're out of balance oftentimes in different ways, but it's the same way, right? Because it's just out of balance, right? My my he was very fiery, uh, pushing, driven, and sometimes I can be procrastinating. Uh, fearful, right? So I would say that my sense is growing every day. What my true north is, is to, and this may sound, you know, too easy in a way, but honestly, as my father said, simplicity is actually the highest form of art. To me, it is simplicity. It's about getting out of my own way, and getting into my own way. How many of us, and I, you know, my hand up first, how many of us are just in our own way? And, we're, own and way. despite best efforts, it's just a human thing. It's, it's just a human thing. Let me read you something else from the book that I'd love you to comment on. You say, instead of opposing force by force, one should complete an opposing movement by accepting the flow of energy from it and defeat it by borrowing from it. This is the law of adaptation. In martial arts, this law could be akin to the idea of using the movement of someone else's strike to create an opening for your own action. Like in the Chi Sao exercise, this means being attuned. And I, I mean, to me, that's the water again. It's, it's not, you know, head on collisions with people. It's not head on collisions with life. It's what you were saying earlier about being your true self, but being in harmony with others. 100%. And I think the important thing is, is that, you know, whatever I'm feeling, thinking, experiencing, rather than wanting to try to change outside conditions, what I really need to do is attempt to work with, understand, and then change my inner conditions in every interaction, in everything that happens, whatever it sparks in me, whether it's like a, oh my God, I, I, I don't know what to do right now. The idea is that the problem is the solution. If we're able to really work with it, that's sort of what it is to borrow, right? It's like when you're in relationship with someone, it's really a mirror for yourself, right? like how those interactions are going. And if someone is being like, you know, really aggressive or in your face, rather than blaming them for being just who they are, by the way, <laughs> right. I get to take that look at like how that triggers me, what in me finds that so distressing how do I heal that in myself? And then also, how do I work with what's coming at me in order to protect myself or use it to... As opposed to trying to change the external. Exactly. Eckhart Tolle has said something along the lines, and I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but something along the lines of there's nothing particularly negative about something that's happening. It's how we respond to something that's happening, how we interpret something that's happening. And yeah. I love what you're saying, because it's basically saying it's a variation of, as you say, some very old wisdom of, you know, I can't control what somebody else is going to do, right. but I can control my own reaction to it. Sure. And, and I would say too, like a really big part of, and the last chapter of my book is sort of focused on this, is this idea of compassion. Because once we look deeply at ourselves, we start to understand all the things that are driving us, you know, how we were raised, the experiences we've had in our lives. And if you're, you know, into certain spiritual notions, maybe even past lives or ancestral trauma or any of that kind of stuff, it's a huge stew that's going on in here, right? And it's a lot to weed through and deal with. And by the way, every single person has their own stew happening and all of their actions and motivations and everything that they do are based on that stew. It's not actually about you or about anyone else. Oh, that's and so wonderful. I want to interrupt you here. And I just want to pause because so much 
um, suffering, but so much of what happens in our lives is really not about us, even if, even if we feel caught up in somebody else's drama. And I think that is so wise. And I would love for so many people to hear this at so many different ages. I mean, certainly there's a lot that people my age go through, but there's a lot that teenagers go through. I mean, I know we don't have all that much time left, but I want to come back to the fundamentals of, of martial arts. So you're a practicing martial artist. Yes. I mean, I'm not as practicing these days as I have been in the past. And what, <laughs> uh, what is your preferred martial art? I mean, I have studied uh, Jeet Kune Do, uh -huh. which is my father's art. Um, uh, and the other one that I've studied primarily is kickboxing. So one of the things I love about it, in addition to the fact that it blends the body and the mind, is yeah. that it's something that really you don't have to have any money. There's no equipment required, something you can do indoors or out. You don't even need a roof. I mean, my own sensei has done wonderful videos on a beach and he's at a level that it looks remarkable. By, and I would love to see so much more of it with young people as a way of just paring down, as you say, simplicity. What do you have in mind in terms of the Bruce Lee Foundation? What is the objective of the Bruce Lee Foundation and what are your sort of... Um, immediate goals with this? The Bruce Lee Foundation is actually in a time of expansion right now. We're really wanting to focus more on this idea of uh, mental wellness through a mind, body, spirit lens. Mm -hmm. And in particular, focusing on our youth who are coming up in this world. The world is always a stressful place, but it seems to be getting more and more stressful as time goes on with all of the polarities and, and changes afoot. That We are focusing very much on that and utilizing my father's practices and teachings as a way into this idea of all the things we've been talking about here, like how to teach some different type of life skills, right? Rather than like, oh, here's how you cook an egg and don't do drugs and, you know, whatever. It's more like, no, let's look at the inner landscape and let's talk about like, how can we uh, research this experience and figure out how to navigate this mental, emotional landscape that challenges all of us so that we can try to be in this world. It's really difficult to be in this world. It's really um, difficult. It's really difficult for all different age groups these days. For all different age groups. And yeah. I think what you're saying is phenomenal. And, and, and I think, you know, some sense of what martial arts can bring in terms of what does power mean? What does balance mean? What are limits? What does it mean to, you know, what is humane in a situation of a competition even? Or okay, how can you make things more effortless? compassion. I mean, I watch people, you know, much older even than I am. And it's extraordinary to watch them engaging in different ways with martial arts. And there's, and everybody gets something different out of it. But I, yeah. I love the mental health aspect of it. I really do. And it's one of the few things that isn't, you know, that, that is both um, possible to do in groups um, and with mentorship, but also possible to do on our own. So, so that's, fun. that's fantastic. Definitely do advocate in the book and in life for having some experience with martial arts. Just, it's such a way of doing inner work and also helping you to gain self-confidence and helping you to work towards certain goals. And if you do ever get to the stage where you're actually interacting with another person and sparring or doing training drills with other people, it's also life is a fight to a certain extent. There are these things that come at us, whether they're thoughts and emotions or whether they're actual experiences that really test us. Mm -hmm. and really take us down a lot of times. And in martial arts, you get to sort of practice that kind of stress and that kind of attack and that kind of being able to keep your wits about you in the height of a very stressful situation. You get to practice that, which is something we all need practice. Yeah. I had an experience the other day where somebody who is very powerful in an organization that I'm involved with was doing something and um, there was a lot of, there were people around me who wanted to react all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I, something came back to me that was very much what I'm not very good at yet in karate, which is don't block things that aren't going to hit you. 
And because I'm not very good, I will be extra ready to swat at something or block something because I, I don't have the judgment to let something come to within a couple of cent, you know, centimeter of me and just yeah. know that it's not going to hit me. And yeah. But in that moment, that lesson, I, I don't necessarily think that I did the masterful job of deploying it in life, but it was just really interesting that that lesson came to me, which is this going to hit me? Am I going to be swatting at something, you know, either blocking or attacking back at something that in any event won't actually hit me in the end. No, I think that's a beautiful lesson because we, I think as human beings, we find ourselves getting caught up in all of these dramas when we don't actually need to be, you know, that's sort of the lesson you're saying. It's like, if it's not really hitting you, like you don't have to rush in ready to like combat something that you could just let go. I have to say you've had such an amazing life journey and even the the difficulty, if I may say so, of growing up with this sensory memory of your father, who is this very famous figure. So there's all sorts of physical evidence of him. There's film, there's his writings, there's words, there's what people say about him. And then you have this memory as a very young child, a very young four-year-old, you know, the, the heartbreak of losing your father. And then the journey all the way to sort of absorbing all of his lessons, further studying, writing this wonderful book that I highly recommend. And then the foundation and all of its goals, it's just an incredible way to keep his legend alive in today's world, in reality, as he would say, to actualize, to actualize it. I think the philosophy and the personal growth aspect and the spiritual aspect, if you will, of my father's life and philosophy is where he and I meet. Uh, I will never be the martial artist that he was. <laughs> I don't nobody actually will. Have, yeah. Nobody will. And I, and I don't have a desire to, but where he and I are share that deep affection and love is in this space. I also, my own path to mm-hmm. want to bring a certain amount of healing uh, into the world and through him and through this way. Shannon, yeah. thank you so very much. This has been fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, the book was wonderful. I'm still trying to absorb all of it and in particular the lessons about healing. So it's yeah. been wonderful to meet you and I'm so grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you reaching out and you wanting to have this conversation and, and, and I thank you for your time.